So thank you so much. Thank you. Um, and then, um, so Kristen, um, you were involved in the launch earlier this year of something called the HODL pack. Um, and I, so I'm familiar with what HODLing is. I think I know what a pack is, uh, but I'm not sure what a HODL pack is. Maybe you can walk us through what that is. Sure, absolutely. Um, HODL pack stands for Helping Our Distributed Ledgers Pack. It's a political action committee for those in the crypto community who want to engage in grassroots and political activities. And what the original concept of the founder, Tyler Wordy, envisioned was um, matching up a political action committee with a DAO. And so this was um, the first iteration that we could come up with that was within existing um, election laws. But we have some great early supporters, including the Winklevoss brothers, Brian Armstrong, and Olaf Carlson Lee. So if you'd like to learn more, go to hodlpack.org. Cool. Uh, well, thanks for that. Um, so turning over to our next segment here, um, we are going to discuss the state of tokens and enforcement in America. Um, so just setting the stage here really quick, uh, there was a smorgasbord of, of token projects that raised millions, sometimes hundreds of million dollars in, in 2017 and 18 through SAFTs and other to forms of token offerings. Um, over the last couple of years, there's been a lot of enforcement projects or, or enforcement actions handed down by the SEC and various class action lawsuits that has put a lot, put a lot of these projects in jeopardy. So um, the SEC, for its part, has made a pretty good faith effort to uh, provide some, some guidelines to the industry on how a token can be, you know, quote unquote, sufficiently decentralized. Uh, many in the industry, uh, you know, haven't really found this to be quite what they were looking for. So there's a lot of contention around this. Um. Today, we're joined by an A-list panel of guests to discuss the current state of affairs. Um, welcome to Rob Cohen, who spent 15 years atop the SEC's enforcement division before joining Davis Polk later this year. Josh Clayman, who is head of blockchain and digital assets at Linklaters. And Karen Ubel of Cooley, who helped to broker the $24 million settlement between Block One and the SEC in what was arguably the most important case of 2019. So, Rob, let's dive right in here. Uh, given the news that Telegram has effectively have capitulated to U.S. regulators and agreed to refund much of its $1.7 billion token sale, uh, as well as ongoing litigation with Kick, I think there's a big question here as to the fate of other crypto projects that raised funds via SAFT. Um, just wondering if you can kind of tell us uh, from your you know, former SEC point of view, what's the, the precedent that's being set here and, and what's the future of the SAFT moving forward? Sure. Thanks, Aaron. So there's at least a couple things to say. First is SAF, uh, they're not inherently illegal, right? There's nothing illegal about doing an offering that way in and of itself. The question, of course, is how does it fit within the securities laws? Um, so the, the idea itself is not, uh, is not necessarily a problem. Um, but the second thing, of course, is that uh, we have the enforcement actions, but we don't have guidance explaining how to approach that type of transaction under the securities laws. Um, SAFs have been talked about, but, and, and there's been guidance about how the SEC thinks about the Howey test in general, but there isn't guidance saying how SAFs fit into it, at least as the SEC looks at it. So what you're left with is what you have on all of these, which is the facts and circumstances test. Uh, the SEC is going to say they look at the facts and circumstances of every transaction. And there's two, there's two parts of that that are particularly important, I think. I think I'm sure by now everybody knows the Howey test, but two things in particular. One, what was the intent of the buyer at the time they committed money? And does it look like to the SEC an investment in a business or does it look like somebody acquiring something that they can use on a platform uh, in exchange for goods and services? What does that really look like? And I think the future project by project is going to depend a lot on how that looks. The other thing that's relevant is how functional and useful was the platform at the time the underlying tokens were distributed. That's an issue that has been uh, the focus uh, in, in these cases. And I'll say, just as a disclosure, I was involved in both of those cases when I was at the SEC. Um, but in projects going forward, uh, there could be different facts that make a case you know, more, uh, more appealing where the um, there's a there's a good record that the platform was really up and running and functional and people were using active using it actively and in very substantial ways when they got those tokens. Karen, you've represented a number of big crypto projects on this front um, and also spent six years at the SEC. Um, what's your view from the front lines? Are the SEC's actions conducive to creating a fair playing field for token projects? 
No, I, you know, this is really a, a challenge for the projects that are trying to grow and launch in the space um, because, you know, when you're using enforcement as policy instead of making real rules or providing real and clear guidance, um, you're, you're really, you know, you're, you're, you're having, you're creating a situation where everyone has to kind of parse out the merits and the facts of a particular case. And it's particularly difficult in a settlement situation where all you're getting is here's the final order. Here are some facts presented by the SEC. Um, you know, with Telegram and Kick, we do have the benefit of seeing some of these arguments really played out and getting some more insight onto the, onto the SEC's position. Um, with with these with these arguments, but um, you know, I think the challenge here is that we we haven't gotten any real guidance. We're three years out from the Dow report, which was in July 2017, um, and and really, you know, the best that we've gotten so far has been the April 3rd framework, which. Uh, I think Commissioner Peirce, uh, you know, kind of described it aptly as saying it's a, a very complex and highly complicated framework that even uh, seasoned securities professionals have a hard time parsing through. So, um, you know, I think it's uh, it's a really challenging environment for projects that are trying to draw some conclusions, and it's very difficult for us um, to be advising them. And I will say, you know, I appreciate that this is a very complex area, and um, a lot has to be done uh, to to educate. Um, and, and I appreciate the idea that technology, new technology doesn't necessarily require new rules, but I think at this point, three years in, we can all kind of agree that um, it's not clear and what's happening of kind of the second guessing and a retroactive basis is really difficult for projects to face on a go forward basis. Sure, sure. Thanks for that. Uh, turning over to Josh now. Uh, welcome, Josh. I like your background. Uh, so. So tell us, Josh, uh, and then Karen, you can also chime in on this as well if you have a, have something to add. But um, so are, are Telegram and Kick you know, really representative of SAFTs more broadly, or are these sort of isolated cases in and amongst themselves? I mean, how much can you extrapolate to another SAFT project just by what we've learned from Telegram and Kick? Well, I think there are a few different ways to answer your question. I mean, certainly the facts of every token sale is are different. Right. And every usage of a SAFT, you have to think about the marketing and other kinds of activities that may have gone into things, the actual language of the SAFTs, the activities that were done to determine what the whether the um, initial purchasers were acting as underwriters, et cetera. Um, so I think there are differences. Now, I do think just at a very broad level, I mean, we're talking about the U.S. securities laws. Right. So the cases and the case law that comes out of this, while we might think that it's focused narrowly on digital assets, I think we just need to be mindful that it's, you know, it potentially may have an effect on the entire securities landscape. And that may, in fact, be some of the rationale behind why certain positions are being taken by regulators. Of course, I can't speak on behalf of regulators. None of us can. And a disclaimer for all of us, none of this is legal advice or investment advice. I do think Excellent. one last thing is this, um, and then I'll turn it over in case other people have thoughts, but I do think that even if Telegram stands, I understand it's under appeal right now, but even if it stands, I do not think that that means that token sales um, are over I, I or need to be. I think even if you avail yourself of an exemption from registration and you follow through on that exemption, you still, under the framework, have the opportunity later to reevaluate whether future sales are sales of an investment contract, not just that initial delivery. Sure. And then, so one more question for you, Josh, really quick. Um, and then we have a couple more to, uh, to wrap up the segment here. But what are the prospects, in your view, of, of, of no action letters for some of these, or no action relief for some of these larger projects? I think most of the the projects that have received no action relief to date haven't, you know, like they're, they've been kind of like smaller kind of edge cases, but uh, well, are, are you optimistic that there might be something in the pipeline here? I am optimistic. Um, in my view, I believe that, I believe what the regulators have been saying, which is that they're looking for good projects that they can provide relief to. Um, whether that is formal no action relief or whether that is throwing up no red flags, I do believe that that is a potential path forward. Um, and I think I look forward to, to seeing that. 
But just, you know, I mean, to be, to be fair, the, the, the SEC are not merit regulators and it's not, I would say it's, it's a challenging path forward if the only path forward is for every project to go in and, and, and get the blessing uh, of the SEC. So I mean, that's Aaron, not, been kind of not what the on this. system is designed to do. So, sorry. Karen, you, you've been a bit outspoken on, on, on some of these issues. I mean, it's kind of been like, it's been pretty standard of, of at crypto conferences the last two, three years to have somebody, you know, a staffer from the SEC on stage being interviewed saying, you know, hey, like, come talk to us, come tell us what you're working on. We're not going to bite, you know, we're not going to come crack down on you. Uh, I mean, given that just a number of, you know, the uptick in enforcement actions that we've been seeing lately, I mean, is this something you advise your clients to do just to go in and, and, and just tell the SEC what you're doing? <laughs> it's a it's a hard decision and it's a hard discussion that we have with a lot of our clients. Um, you know, in my history when I was at the SEC, I felt like when we had those meetings, when I was on the other side of the table, it was a real give and take and a back and forth. Um, and to the extent that that's what is accomplished, I think that there is real value there. But I, uh, you know, my experience lately has been there, there hasn't been as much of that. And so it becomes a very expensive proposition when you're not able to really get any feedback out of it. And the feedback is, well, they seemed to like it a little bit. And you're trying to, you know, make guesses and in innuendo and uh, interpretations from, you know, I mean, and again, we're not going and asking for a blessing, but, um, you know, feedback in a, in a very uh, opaque environment is certainly very helpful. So uh, to the extent that, you know, it, it could be valuable for sure. Uh, I just think, you know, you have to be very specific about what your goals are and your message and your questions uh, when you go into me with the staff and be really prepared. Sure, sure. Kristen, do you have anything you want to add here? Um, well, I would like Another to hear real question. quickly, Rob, before we have to wrap up here, let's give you the final word as somebody that was at the SEC. Um, the SEC does take a lot of criticism. I'm often the one doling out that criticism in my day job. But um, can you give us some insight as to how you think the SEC has evolved in their thinking um, from the Dow to today? Well, a couple things. Um, so first of all, what um, I think what you see in the cases, uh, whether you agree with them or not, is an effort to follow a progression. What I don't think anybody wants is, whether you're on the government side or the industry side or a lawyer representing a client, nobody wants to look at an enforcement case and be really surprised that the government would take that case, uh, pursue that case. You may or may not agree with the position the government's taking, but there shouldn't be a lot of surprise. And so um, people have different opinions about whether or not that's been successful. But in the progression from the Dow report to some of the early cases to the framework that was issued and then some of the more complicated cases you've been talking about today, I think there's been that effort at least. And it's important because every action the government takes sends a message. And the message will be undermined if people feel like it's hard to understand what the government's doing and why. You want certainty, you want predictability. Whether or not you agree with it, you want to at least understand what the government's doing. And when you see how the government is using their resources, you want to be able to say, okay, that makes sense. I may not agree with why they're doing it, but I understand it. If the public and the industry doesn't understand what the government's doing, then it really undermines the message. Sure. Great. Great. Well, that's all the time we have for today, folks. Um, so thanks to Rob, Karen, and Josh so much for joining us. And and uh, for to our viewers, be sure to check out our other editions of Capital Controls. We have an Asia edition tonight at 10 p.m. Eastern, and we have a Europe edition uh, at 7 a.m. Eastern uh, tomorrow. And um, those will be run by uh, Coindesk's, uh, Coindesk Korea will be running the Asia edition, and then our own Mark Hochstein and the new Binance uh, UK director, Tina Baker-Taylor, will be co-hosting the Europe edition. Um, and we've also got other great policy content lined up this week, uh, looking at central bank digital currencies, the travel rule, and DeFi risk and regulation, one I'm particularly looking forward to with Jake Stravinsky and Jason Somensato. Uh, so we hope you can join us for that. And, and just a quick reminder that 5 p.m. today, don't forget to check out our uh, special music show uh, where we will be talking about blockchain and we'll have some special performances from some special guests, musical guests. And uh, we'll be helping to raise COVID relief money for our uh, New York Blockchain Week Gives campaign. Coming up next, we have a special edition of Trade Secrets, where, you're, where you'll hear exclusive talks from Chainalysis economists Philip Gradwell and PwC Global Head of Crypto, Henry Arslanian, who will be discussing the findings of his new crypto hedge fund report. This has been Capital Controls. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us. And enjoy the rest of Consensus Distributed. Thank you.